Hello everyone. So in this pre-lecture tutorial we're going to wrap up chapter 20 by discussing electrolytic cells and electrolysis. Um, and so to put things in context again we spoken about voltaic or galvanic cells in which we have a spontaneous redox process occurring. Electrolytic cells are just the opposite, where basically we are using a power source, a source of electrical energy, to actually drive a non-spontaneous reaction. And so uh, there are a couple of practical applications to electrolysis, one of which is isolating metals from salts. And so one way to do this is to actually carry out electrolysis of molten salts. And so take, for example, the electrolytic cell that's actually pictured on the slide right now. Essentially, we have a setup that's very similar to a voltaic cell, with the exception that we have a power source included right here, a battery. And so the way that it works is in this particular electrolytic cell, we're trying to isolate sodium metal from molten sodium chloride. And so if you recall, basically, if I have sodium chloride as a solid, if I melt that down, then I have sodium cations in their liquid state as well as chloride ions in their liquid state. And so these ions are present in this mixture right here, which represents the melted salt. And so what's going to happen is we're still going to have an anode and a cathode, and the anode still is the electrode where oxidation takes place and the cathode is still the electrode where reduction takes place. And so if we take a look at each of these ions, okay, if I have sodium cation and I have it in its liquid state, if I'm going to end up with sodium metal, then the sodium cation must gain an electron. And so since an electron is being gained, then this would actually represent a reduction process. And this reduction process would take place at the cathode. And so that's what we see depicted on this side of this particular diagram. Basically, the sodium cations are migrating over to the cathode so that they can accept electrons and ultimately be converted to sodium metal that would begin to coat the surface of the cathode. Now, on the other side, basically, I have chloride ions. Okay, now basically what's going to happen here is I can actually get elemental chlorine if these chloride ions actually end up losing an electron. But if you recall, basically elemental chlorine is diatomic, so basically I would need two chloride ions, and to preserve charge neutrality, then basically there should be two electrons involved in this process as well. And so I can form chlorine gas from chloride ion if, a, if an oxidation process takes place. And so this oxidation process would take place at the anode. And so that's what we see here with the bubbles of chlorine gas forming around the anode. Now, again, basically since the anode reflects the oxidation process and oxidation is the loss of electrons and basically electrons would travel away from the anode towards the battery. Now basically if the electrons are going to travel through the battery then this end of the battery must be the positive end to attract the negatively charged electrons. Once they exit the battery basically the electrons would then travel towards the cathode in order in order for the electrons to travel away from the battery in that sense, then basically the opposite end of the battery must be the negatively charged end of the battery. So if I go ahead and also finish up considering this electrochemical process, then that would mean I would need to add these two equations to each other. These each represent the half reactions for this overall redox process. Uh, since there are two electrons involved, in the oxidation half reaction, I would need two electrons to be involved in the reduction process. And that would happen if I multiplied the entire reduction half reaction by a factor of two. So if I go ahead and do that, and then add vertically, the electrons would cancel out. And my overall 
redox process for this electrolytic cell would be the following. I would have two moles of sodium cation plus two moles of chloride ion giving me two moles of sodium metal and one mole of chlorine gas. Now, basically, if I'm going to melt down a salt, we know that ionic compounds are very, very strong in terms of the bonds that hold the cations and the anions together, then that means I have to elevate the temperature of the salt to a very high temperature. And so one might ask themselves, well, is there an easier way? I know that I can also get access to free cations and anions in aqueous solution. And so the fact of the matter is, yes, we can actually electrolyze aqueous solutions as well, but that becomes a bit trickier because, again, the water that comprises the solvent in aqueous solutions can add an extra complication. Water can actually be oxidized. If I take water and oxidize it, then I would get oxygen. The rest of that half reaction would be as follows. And I would have four moles of protons and four moles of electrons. So water can be oxidized. At the same time, water can also be reduced. So this is the oxidation half reaction. I can also reduce water. And if I do, then basically I'll get hydrogen gas and hydroxide ions. Okay, and these two half reactions will actually compete with any electrolysis half reaction involved with the salt itself. And so I have to be very careful if I'm actually trying to isolate a specific element from a salt via the electrolysis of aqueous solutions because I could end up getting one of these two half reactions being favored and not getting the either the metal or the halogen gas that I'm looking for the other species that comes from the uh, electrolytic process involving the anion. So for example suppose that I wanted to run an electrolysis of nickel bromide and I want to use the aqueous solution of nickel bromide as opposed to the molten salt. Well, let's actually consider the oxidation processes and let's also consider the reduction processes. And this will illustrate the point that I was trying to make regarding the oxidation and reduction of water. As I mentioned earlier, basically one possible oxidation process for the aqueous solution of nickel bromide would actually be the oxidation of water. So I'm going to write out this half reaction. And in order to tell whether or not this is the favored oxidation process or not, I'm going to have to look up the standard reduction potential. And so if I look at the standard reduction potential, I can see right here that basically that comes out to plus 1.23 volts. However, since I'm depicting this as an oxidation process instead of a reduction process, then basically the standard oxidation potential for this process would be negative 1.23 volts. All right, now considering nickel bromide in greater detail, nickel bromide would dissociate into nickel 2 plus cation as well as two moles of bromide anion. It's also entirely possible that I could oxidize the bromide ion that comes from the nickel bromide. And so that would look like this. Two moles of aqueous bromide ion giving me liquid elemental bromine and two moles of electrons. If I look up the standard potential for that reaction, that's right here. Okay, now again, these are reduction potentials, and so since I'm considering this as an oxidation process, I'm going to reverse the sign to get the oxidation potential, and I get negative 1.07 volts. Now, if you recall, basically the way it works is the more positive the value, the more likely that particular half-reaction process. 
And so since negative 1.07 is closer to positive numbers than negative 1.23, then that means that the oxidation potential for the bromide ion, bromide ion indicates that the oxidation of the bromide ion is actually favored. And so if I were to run this electrolytic cell, then I would indeed actually get elemental bromine occurring in the oxidation process, and this would start to accumulate around the anode. Now, if I consider the reduction processes, like I said earlier, basically it is entirely possible that I might reduce water to get hydrogen gas as well as hydroxide ion. Okay, if I take a look at that reduction potential, basically I get the following. I get negative 0.83 volts. So here are the reduction potential, and since I'm using this as a reduction potential, I don't change this sign. I get negative 0.83 volts. Now, I could also end up reducing the nickel, and that's actually what I would like in this case. I would like to isolate the nickel. And so if I have nickel to cation, gain two electrons, then I will get solid elemental nickel. And if I look up that reduction potential, basically that would be negative 0.28 volts. And again, since negative 0.28 volts is closer to positive numbers than negative 0.83 volts, then basically the nickel reduction process is the favored half reaction here. And so I would actually get the formation of solid nickel occurring on the surface of the cathode. Now, as it turns out, then if I wanted to actually get nickel and bromine from nickel bromide then, or nickel 2 bromide, then basically I could actually electrolyze the aqueous solution and it would be as effective as the electrolysis of the molten salt. But that's not always the case. Take, for example, the electrolysis of aluminum fluoride. All right, once again, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to consider the possible oxidation processes, which would take place at the anode, as well as the reduction processes, that would take place at the cathode. And again, since I'm using an aqueous solution, it is possible that the oxidation of water could occur. And so I'm going to go ahead and copy that from the previous problem, along with its associated standard oxidation potential of negative 1.23 volts. Now again, aluminum fluoride, if it's an aqueous solution, would give me aluminum cation as well as three moles of fluoride anion. And it is entirely possible, or at least I'm hoping, that I could take this fluoride ion and actually end up reducing it so that I get elemental fluorine if it loses electrons. And so basically in order to go ahead and balance this out, I would need the following. So if I go ahead and consult the uh, table of standard reduction potentials, basically I'm looking for this half reaction right there, where the reduction, the standard reduction potential is plus 2.87 volts. Again, since I'm considering the oxidative process, then that should be negative. 2.87 volts. And again, just a reminder, basically, again, even though I am multiplying this through by a factor, recall that since uh, potentials are actually intrinsic properties, then it is not necessary to multiply through by any multiplying factor that I would need to adjust the half reaction. But the point to consider here is that of the two oxidation potentials, basically the more positive one of the two is actually the oxidation of water. And so what that means is I'm not going to get elemental fluorine uh, bubbling out 
near the anode for this electrochemical cell. Basically, instead, I'm going to get oxygen being produced at the anode since the more positive oxidation potential implies that basically that would be the more thermodynamically favored half reaction. If I go ahead and perform the same exercise with the reduction processes, and so here's the reduction process from above regarding the reduction of water, that would be negative 0 0.83 volts. Um, I'm hoping that basically aluminum would ultimately be reduced so that I get aluminum solid. And if I go ahead and look up that reduction potential, that would be right here. We see that that is negative 1.66 volts. And so of the two half reactions, the more positive reduction potential actually corresponds to the reduction of water. So that means that not only am I not going to get the elemental fluorine at the anode, but basically I'm going to get production of hydrogen gas produced at the cathode. So I'm not going to get either the aluminum nor the fluorine if I try and electrolyze an aqueous solution of aluminum fluoride. The only way that I could get these two elements back again from the, salt, from the salt is to actually electrolyze the molten salt. And so you do have to be careful when trying to decide how to isolate metals from their respective salts using electrolysis because if you try and use an aqueous solution instead of a molten salt, you may not get what you bargained for. Um, also another warning, if you will, sometimes these reduction potentials aren't necessarily the most reliable indicators of what may happen. Um, there's a phenomenon known as overvoltage um, that may actually mess with these patterns a little bit. For now, the questions that we're going to be dealing with center on the uh, voltages, these reduction potentials as being firm indicators of what would actually happen in the electrolytic cells. But just be aware that in practicality, sometimes it doesn't work out exactly as the reduction potentials would actually indicate. And one final part about this section that I wanted to mention was electrolytic stoichiometry. In other words, um, how can I calculate how much of a metal I'm going to actually form on an electrode during an electrolytic reaction? Um, this formation of a metal from an electrolytic reaction, it's called electroplating. And so in order to do those calculations, we need to employ a specific relationship, and that relationship involves electrical current. Electrical current is defined by the charge that travels within a specific segment of an electrochemical cell in a specific amount of time. So I can calculate the charge if I know the current passing through the cell and how long the current is being applied for. Now, we can often use that information to actually then use the stoichiometry of a half reaction to go and calculate out how much metal I'm going to get. So take, for example, this uh, practice AP question from 2007. I have a power supply in this electrochemical cell, and so that means that this is an electrolytic cell. Uh, note that uh, there is some sort of gas forming over here at this electrode, but over here, Basically, I have copper cation gaining two electrons, and so basically this would be my reduction half reaction, which identifies this reaction as the cathode. Automatically, this means that this gas is being evolved at the anode. And I'm given the reduction potentials for each, but I want to call your attention to this particular problem down here. I'm being told that an electric current of 1.5 amps, which are amperes, which are the unit of current, that current is passing through the cell for 40 minutes. And I'm supposed to calculate the mass in grams of the solid copper that's deposited on the cathode. And so, again, we would have to make use of this relationship first and foremost. 
we want to calculate the charge that's involved in that particular electrolytic process. And so I'm going to take my current of 1.50 amps. I'm going to multiply by the time, which is 40 minutes. Okay, but we should convert this to the SI unit of time. So I'm going to go ahead and convert this to seconds. And so in every one minute, there are 60 seconds. Now that I'm in seconds, all right, basically this whole portion of math would ultimately be in units of coulombs. All right, now once I'm here, I want to relate these coulombs to the moles of electrons that are involved in the electrochemical process. Now, these units should look familiar because they're the units of Faraday's constant. And so I would use Faraday's constant to convert the number of coulombs or the charge that is actually passed through the electrochemical cell and convert it to moles of electrons. Once I'm here, then I can actually use the stoichiometry of the copper half reaction to actually calculate how many moles of copper would form and then ultimately how many grams would form. And so that would mean that for every two moles of electrons, basically I'm going to form one mole of the copper solid. And if I use the molar mass of copper solid, 63.55 grams of copper for one mole of copper. And if I do this math, I end up with 1.19 grams of copper solid formed. Okay, and so these types of calculations involving electroplating and the application of an electrical current for a specific time, that's actually pretty common on the AP exam and is actually a pretty practical problem even if you're not considering the AP chem exam as something that is foremost on your mind. Basically, people that do work in electrochemistry would actually employ these types of calculations if they're looking for a specific amount of metal that they would like to isolate or to plate on a specific object. So uh, go ahead and try the follow-up assignment. Also, please make sure to read the corresponding section of the book. Uh, also, when that particular assignment gets assigned, when the application activity gets uploaded, please make sure you give that your attention as well. Um, feel free to email your questions, and when we reconvene in class, I will address any other specific questions or comments that you might have. So uh, enjoy the rest of your break, and I will see you guys in class next week.